I'm going to go ahead and introduce Scott Fitzpatrick. And Scott, I'm sure you can give your background. And I know that uh, Amanda's going to do our interview. So with that, turn over to Scott. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. Yeah. I've got the piece of paper up like if I had notes. But uh, anyway, well, there are some definitely some familiar faces, but also some, some new faces since the last time uh, I've been here. I came. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I've kind of kind of tried to come to several of these meetings, and obviously my schedule's changed a little bit, so I'm not able to, to make it really anymore. But I am glad to have an opportunity to come up and talk with you guys uh, a little bit. I think, from what I gather, you kind of just want me to talk a little bit about background and how how I ended up doing this job that I'm doing. I think so. If you want to start with uh, kind of how you got to the legislature and where your position is now. Yeah. So we can do that, and then uh, is it okay if I talk a little bit about what's on the, a couple of things on the ballot at yeah. some point? Okay, um, and then I think you'll have questions for me too. That I, if anybody else has a question, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so first, thanks for the invitation. It's, it's always uh, good to be in Southwest Missouri uh, on a weekday. Uh, obviously, as the treasurer, my office is in Jefferson City. And so I travel pretty frequently between Jeff City and Southwest Missouri and really all parts of the state, uh, pretty much in every corner of the state every week, it seems like at some point. So um, so it's always nice to be in Southwest Missouri. But background for those of you who don't know me or haven't met me or aren't familiar with me at all, uh, I, I grew up in Shell Mob, so um, Berry County. I was I actually lived on the Stone County side, but grew up on Table Rock Lake. I went to Cassville, so I actually live in Cassville now uh, with my wife and twin boys Ooh. that are, yeah. <laughs> well, here, here's what I'll say about, about that is, number one, I'm, I'm, I've always been a big fan of Monette. Uh, you know, obviously, not, you know, not the same in the times I was playing <laughs> in sports, but uh, it's good as somebody who lives in Cassville to have Monette 15, 20 minutes up the road because you know, really, it's the hub of industry for for Barry County, frankly, uh, and for you know drawing from from really all over Southwest Missouri, and so it's kind of been for this for Cassville as a Cassville guy, Mona has just been a, a godsend in terms of employment opportunities for people down there and so on and so forth. So uh, that's my nice thing to say about Monette as a Cassville guy, uh, and obviously I've enjoyed getting to know and work with Jeff over the years. But I, I got into politics. It was not uh, something that I planned on doing when I was growing up. I wasn't one of the people that, you know, from the moment I knew what the president of the United States was or something like I wanted to get into politics. That's not uh, really kind of why I ended up here. I ended up here kind of through just some experiences that I had in business. When I was in high school, I started a small company working on boat docks. I grew up on the lake and it was kind of a natural progression for me. Uh, my, my dad was in, in the dock business for a period of time and sold the company doing that. I worked for him a couple of summers when I was a, a freshman and sophomore of high school. And so I started after he sold out, I started working on docks because I kind of knew how to do it and also enjoyed being, being on the water. I mean, it's kind of the re reason I ended up doing what I did. And over time, that uh, turned into a boat dock manufacturing company. Uh, we manufacture and install dock systems around the United States, uh, all, really all over the country, primarily commercial installations uh, for marinas. And that was, uh, when I first started it though, it was started building docks. It was my senior year of high school in 2006. There was a storm that went through Table Rock Lake and tore some docks up and I had an opportunity after that happened, I went went out and I knew there were some customers out there. So I went and found them and asked them if they'd give me an opportunity to give them a bid. And they did. And so I did the material takeoffs and knew enough about putting one together that I was able to estimate, you know, the cost of doing that. And I ended up selling a couple of docks. Uh, this was my last semester of high school. And so I actually outsourced the manufacturing side of that at the time to a now defunct fabrication operation from Monette, uh, which was, I don't know if any of you were around or remember Olympia uh, over there on the other side of the railroad tracks, but I used Olympia uh, back in the day to fabricate most of the steel components and obviously had a lot of bio items. So I did that 
started installing docks. And uh, did about that year I graduated high school, we did about $670 million, $670,000. It would have been nice if it was six hundred. I wouldn't be here right now. Uh, did about $670,000 in sales. And then uh, hired some people to help me manage that. It was kind of, it did present some obstacles being an 18 year old kid trying to sell people docks. It, it was kind of an obstacle, you know, just because I obviously was really young. And so people had their doubts. So I ended up hiring people that, to help in those parts of the business and kind of managed it from college. I went to Mizzou, traveled back and forth and really doubled the business for the next couple of years. The recession, uh, from 2008, 2009, kind of leveled things off for a little bit, caused us some pretty substantial challenges in terms of cash management. We had customers that had difficulty paying us, things like that, for a period of time, thought it was just going to go down to flames, um, which at the time I was 20 years old, 21 years old. So, you know, if you're ever going to fail, it's probably the best time to do it when you're late teens, early 20s, right? And if you're going to go bankrupt, why not do it then? Fortunately, I, I was able to avoid that. Had, you know, I, I'd say by the grace of God, uh, had uh, some things happen that uh, generated some business. And so when I graduated from Mizzou in 2010, we had about 30, 30 employees. I think we did about four and a half million dollars that year in sales that I uh, that I graduated from Mizzou. Came home and was kind of focused on building the do building docks and trying to grow the company. But it was really that experience that I had growing the business during the recession that. that turn my eye to politics. I didn't really pay attention until like the 2008 presidential race, which was when, uh, you know, we were right in the middle of the Great Recession. Uh, it was Obama versus McCain. I started getting very interested in what was happening in both our federal and our state government. Because I felt like as a small business person, I was being introduced on kind of, it seemed like a weekly basis to some new entity of government that I owed money to for a permit or for a a license or you know fuel tax or unemployment tax or you name know, sales tax use tax all the different taxes you had to figure out that the work and then doing it in every different state that you worked in you know became to me uh, a thing that was like not very pleasant and it was oftentimes not pleasant because of the people that you were dealing with on the other end of the phone uh, or in the office at, at the government agency just really didn't seem to care about kind of the challenges of the people in the real world. And that's why I got interested in politics. So in 2012, uh, our state representative, who uh, at the time was David Sater, who is now our state senator, is, is term limiting out of the Senate this year and is going to be retiring. Well, he was term limited out of the House in 2012. So I've been home uh, for from college. I moved back from the zoo uh, down to Shellab. I was kind of batching it for a couple of years. My wife uh, lived in Little Rock. She wasn't my wife at the time. She was uh, my girlfriend lives in Little Rock, moved to North Carolina for work. Uh, so I, I decided to run for state representative. And that was for Berry County, a little bit of Lawrence County, a little bit of Stone County. Ran in a three-way primary um, in, in 2012. Ended up winning that primary, I think, despite... I, I, most people, I don't think, thought I was going to win, but I really, I think the... the the thing I learned from that is that even if you're an underdog, if you work your ass off, you can really accomplish things. I went out and knocked doors in every, pretty much, I think every precinct in the county. I was, there were days where I would be on farm roads. I'd be driving, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes between houses just to go talk to voters. And, you know, I kind of came up with a plan where I was going to hit the voter, the households that had at least two voters that had voted at least in two of the last four elections, which that data I was able to get. And so I kind of, I came up with a strategy and executed it, ended up winning that, that primary. And, you know, I had people, there were places I went where I had to put my truck in four wheel drive to get to people's house. Uh, there was one guy who was a I pulled up to there. I ended up not going to their house. There was a sign that said, trespassers will be shot, survivors will be shot again. So I said it and pulled the lead on that one. But uh, the bottom line is I just kind of you know, worked hard to get it done. So I got to the legislature and they kind of, when you get to the legislature, the first thing you have to figure out is like, what, what do you want to focus on? There's so many areas of policy. There's 163 people in the House of Representatives. There's 34 in the Senate. 
and the, most of the work, especially in the House of Representatives, happens in committees. Uh, and so subsets of the House that get together to work on legislation before it comes to the floor. And so they ask you, what, well, what committees would you like to be on? Well, I didn't really know. I didn't have thought about that, frankly. I just knew why I was there. I was there because I was really frustrated with the government and that I just wanted to do something to at least hold, hold your bureaucracies accountable and at least keep it from getting worse. You know, and that was just like kind of the, the baseline goal uh, for, for people that are trying to build small businesses. And, and frankly, I felt like government had just become involved in far too many aspects of our lives. Um, I, you know, I, I started to see that a lot more when I got in the business, but I really kind of felt like, uh, like that in general. And so I was like, well, I guess I need to think about it. So I did a little research and I kind of ended up thinking, well, the best way to probably get the attention of state agencies is to control their money. And so I decided that it has to be put on the budget committee before I ended up. And I kind of dove in and, and became, really became probably the most knowledgeable elected official on the state budget in the state because I was just, I put my mind to it and that was what I was going to do and uh, ultimately became the chairman of the House Budget Committee. So in that role, I was responsible for writing the state budget. And when I say the state budget, the way it works in the state government is the executive branch submits their budget requests, the governor submits his recommendations to the legislature <laughs> after receiving requests from all the agencies of the state, and then the legislature is responsible for deciding what they're going to grant in terms of spending authority. That is the budget. And so if the legislature doesn't provide an appropriation through the budgeting process for something, then the government can't spend money on it. And so that was what I what I did in the legislature. I focused on that. I wrote the state budget. It was about a $30 billion budget. Uh, and the main things I focused on were that what I what I learned was that the will, I mean, even with fiscal conservatives, most of them still wanted to spend all the money. <laughs> it, and oftentimes, uh, you know, not, not only all, every dollar that we had and every dollar that we thought we were going to have during that fiscal year. So the process is you go and you estimate revenues, right? That how you budget. I'm sure that you guys forecast sales at your businesses uh, that you work at. The state, state does the same thing. We forecast revenue uh, from income tax, sales tax, corporate income tax, um, the insurance premium tax, and, and, and a bunch of variety of sources of revenue. And then we come up with a, what we call a consensus revenue estimate, which is a, a number that the governor, the House, and the Senate all sign off on uh, to, to use as what we budgeted to. But then everybody would try to get creative and play a bunch of games with like, well, you know, we'll have some laps over here. You know, this money we may budget it, but it may not get spent. So we can reallocate, we can spend that again over here. Or we've got money in these other funds over here that we can transfer to the general revenue fund. And so they come up with all these different ways to make the number bigger than what we all would have, you know, agreed to. Uh, and then even after all that, they would, you know, the budget would be designed to basically, if everything went according to plan, we would have no money in the bank at the end of the fiscal year, which is a state government with a $30 billion budget, you can't have no money in, you know, in the bank. That's not, you wouldn't do that in your business. I don't do it in my business. We wouldn't do that at home. And so I just was like, you know, this is insane. This is the, you know, how are we, how are we honestly like doing this and going back and telling people we're passing a balanced budget? Because every year, the first thing that doesn't go according to plan, whether that be we have some cost that comes in that we didn't forecast appropriately or revenue doesn't come in according to plan, what happens is the balance, the budget's out of balance, and then it's on the governor to decide where in the budget should he withhold money from to make it balanced. And so I, that was a thing that frustrated me a lot uh, when I was a legislator. So I cut, I cut the budget, uh, cut a lot of things out of the budget because I felt like we needed to do a better job prioritizing as the legislature and not just building basically a wish list and turning it over to the executive branch to figure out how to balance. And so I turned to basically a budget that was typically not even really balanced because it would always end up getting withheld from into a budget that for the first time in a very long time, there were no withholds from it that the, that the governor had to make. Um, that every year I was there the, in, in terms of the budget, the budget chairman, the budget finished the year without any withhold. And we had a $500 million surplus. And so that was kind of the thing I was probably, I was really proud of from my time in the house. And I also, at the same time, fully funded the education foundation formula, which is the first time that had ever happened. So we cut, we cut things from the budget. 
we went out and we uh, fully funded the education formula. And, you know, the, the craziest thing about it was the most criticism I took was from people saying that, why are we not spending all this money? Why are we changing the process, you know, to, to set money aside on the bottom line? You know, people need this money. It's like, no, that we, we need to actually have cash in the bank in case there's an emergency. What happens if we have another Joplin tornado? Uh, what if we have, you know, massive flooding or let, you know, or a bridge gets taken out by a barge somewhere? You know, we have to have uh, resources on hand to deal with problems. And, you know, so anyway, it actually, so that worked out. And actually, the legislature has done a pretty good job. And so has the governor. And we've all kind of worked together and have kind of maintained that. And frankly, with, with everything that's happened uh, related to COVID, uh, the, you know, the, re the revenue kind of contraction that's come along with that at the state, because obviously when, when things shut down for a period of time, uh, we're going to see, I think, pretty sizable drops in income tax receipts as, at the state government. Uh, we saw a short-term kind of downturn in the sales tax revenue. But we were in a pretty good condition to weather that, right? Because we... Taken prep, we've taken steps to prepare for that. So that was one of the things when I was the budget chairman, I really focused on. But when the election happened in 2018, uh, Josh Hawley ran for the United States Senate against Claire McCaskill. Josh was the attorney general. He'd gotten elected as attorney general in 2016 and then it ran for Senate in 2018. He won that election, went to DC, which created a vacancy in the state attorney general's office. And the governor by law has to fill vacancies in statewide offices when they occur. And so the governor chose to appoint Eric Schmidt, who was serving as the state treasurer. He was elected state treasurer in 2016. It had his eye on the attorney general's office as well. Uh, and so the governor appointed him to be the attorney general, which created another vacancy uh, in the treasurer's office. And th the interesting thing about this is, I'm sure some of you are aware, the, the governor was originally elected in 2016 as the lieutenant governor. Uh, Eric Greit was elected as the governor. He resigned in 2018. And so by virtue of the way the Constitution is written, the Lieutenant Governor Mike Parson ascended to become Governor Mike Parson uh, and then had to appoint a replacement Lieutenant Governor. So we're in this very weird situation in Missouri government where the Governor ascended to the office, the Lieutenant Governor was appointed to the office, the uh, Secretary of State was elected, uh, Jay Ashcroft, he was elected in 2016. Um, the State Auditor, Nicole Galloway, she's obviously running for Governor. She actually was appointed in uh, 2015 full, uh, as auditor after uh, Tom Schweik passed away. He was a state auditor, uh, and she was appointed by Governor Nixon and then ran for a full term in 2018 and was reelected. And so, uh, and then obviously I was appointed to be the treasurer, and Eric Schmidt was appointed to be the attorney general. So we have a government, uh, currently have a government where the only statewide elected official that was originally elected to the office of the turn was, the, was Jay Ashcraft as the Secretary of State. So hopefully, um, you know, Nicole was reelected, obviously. Governor Parson and Eric Schmidt won statewide ele elections, but were but ended up in different offices. So hopefully after 2016, I mean, one way or the other, the people in the offices will, be, will have been elected to do those jobs. And so anyway, after the governor, when he had the opportunity to appoint a treasurer. He appointed me. I was I was in the House still. I was getting ready to start my last term in the House of Representatives. He appointed me uh, to be the state treasurer at the end of 2018. I took office in January of 2019 and have been serving in that role uh, for just under two years. So uh, by virtue of coming into that office in the middle of a term, uh, it is a statewide elected office. So I, I took office in the middle of the term. I am on the ballot right now, I'll be on the ballot. And I mean, if you, if you vote absentee, then you've already seen my name, but if you don't, if you vote on November 3rd, I'll be on the ballot running for state treasurer to basically uh, for a four year term uh, that would start in January. So it's been kind of an adventure. If you'd asked me two years ago what I'd be doing right now, I would not have told you I was going to be the state treasurer. I, would, I had no idea. And so, uh, you know, things just kind of happen, I guess, in life sometimes. And I really enjoyed the office. The, uh, the state treasurer's office uh, is responsible for quite a few things. Uh, some of it is probably, you know, you'll probably start counting sheep if I talk about it too long. Uh, but it's, uh, we're, we're the custodian of all state funds. So I manage the state's portfolio. We have about a $7, $7 billion cash portfolio that, that we manage. 
uh, in the treasurer's office. And we also manage we're, we, uh, all the, we're the custodian funds. So we have about 420 or 30 funds in the state treasury that have been created throughout the history of the state. Those funds are typically created by virtue of, a, of legislation, either statutory or constitutional, that creates a new function of government. So that so whenever there's some new function of government created, typically there's a fund created to receive money and spend money from uh, to support that function. And so uh, we manage we manage all those. We have to approve all the payments. So no money can leave the treasury without the treasurer's uh, approval or signature. So we have to uh, we have to approve all the payments. We manage all the bank accounts. We have uh, deposit accounts with. I think a little over 160 financial institutions in the state. Uh, and so our office is responsible for reconciling all of that activity. Uh, and uh, we also are responsible for uh, allocating the investment uh, uh, returns across all those state funds. Uh, and like I said, we manage the portfolio. So uh, that, that all takes place in the banking division. The investments division uh, actually invests the cash. So uh, we're in a situation right now in a historically low interest rate environment. Uh, as some of my banking friends are aware, which is obviously makes um, uh, investing kind of challenging, uh, especially given that we're constitutionally restricted from investing in, in anything very exotic. We're frankly only allowed to buy uh, debt of the U.S. government, whether it's uh, treasury bonds, we can do agencies like Freddie, uh, Fannies and Freddies. Uh, we, we do commercial paper, which is basically uh, short-term corporate debt. Uh, we only do the most highly rated entities on that in terms of buying. We'll go out and buy, you know, three-month commercial paper uh, from from companies that uh, that will pay a little additional yield from time to time. Right now, it's not that great because the Federal Reserve decided they get involved in the commercial paper market, uh, just like they've gotten involved in a lot of other things uh, since the pandemic started. Uh, so they kind of messed that one up for us. But uh, bottom line is we also run on a, a link deposit program, uh, which is uh, a pretty unique program. And not every state has one, but it allows me to put money in, in the banks across the state at a discounted interest rate, uh, provided that those banks will turn around and loan that money to uh, borrowers, which, are, which have to be small businesses or farmers uh, at a discount. So it requires you know, the bank to establish a market interest rate for a borrower and then the borrower gets a 30% discount on that rate. So uh, if they use the link deposit program. So we field the applications for that, work with the banks across the state. We have about $500 million of the state's portfolio in that program where we uh, deposit the money into the banks. Uh, they turn around and loan it out of the discount interest rate. Interest rate. Uh, so uh, we also run the unclaimed property program. This is one of the more interesting parts of the office. We receive about $100 million per year gets turned over to us on unclaimed property. Uh, that's anything from, uh, it can be life insurance policies where they can't find, so they know somebody passed away, but they can't find the beneficiary from the policy. And so it gets turned over to us as unclaimed property. We'll get uh, utility accounts where somebody had to place a deposit when they, when they signed up for a utility account and they moved and didn't get their deposit back. My mom had a Sonic gift card that got turned over. Her purse got stolen one time. We get, uh, we also get a lot. We get securities turned over to us. So uh, we get stock. As I, I had one lady down here in Barry County who had stock in AT and T. And the address that they had for her, she moved from that address, and they were continuing to mail her dividend checks. Well, over time, that got to be eleven or twelve thousand dollars, and she didn't know that she had it. And so we got we got that. She saw it in the paper. We have to publish the names of people in the paper. So she asked me what it was, and I looked it up, and it was, I was like, oh, we've got like eleven thousand dollars of AT and T dividends that are yours. So she got eleven thousand dollars. We and we give out. Last year we returned about forty five million dollars for a little over two hundred thousand people. We came up with a program where we're working with the Department of Social Services to compare the list of people who are passed through on child support against our list of people who, who we owe on land property to. And so we basically created a system to cross-reference that on a monthly basis. And we, this year we paid, we started it this year and we paid out uh, about $3 million in, in payments to families who were owed past due child support. And had one family, I think they got about $25,000. 
We're going to do a similar program with the Department of Labor. Since we've had a ton of people file for unemployment this year, we have very current data uh, for, with the Department of Labor on, on names, addresses, social security numbers. And so we're working together with them. We're going to announce this later this week. So I guess Melanie walked out. So, so, so you know, I guess that's online too. Anyway, we're going to announce that later this week. But we're going to have uh, prop tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that will be able to identify. Uh, and, and to me, that's one of the things I've seen in government is it's so siloed. You've got 16 executive branch agencies, six statewide offices. Uh, that, that all have their own functions and they're all focused on those functions. But there's so many areas in government where if you break down the barriers and you kind of work cross departmentally, you can accomplish a lot of good things. And there's just not a lot of, I think, I don't think there's a lot of desire to do that. And that's one of the things I've really been focused on in our office is like, how can we work together? You know, when we had the tax due date, it got to get moved from April 15th to July 15th. The state was in a pretty bad cash flow situation in our general revenue fund because of that. Because we typically collect about a billion dollars in April uh, from people sending in their refunds. Well, the interesting thing about that is we also get about a billion dollars worth of refund applications that come in at that time. And so when you still have the people that are filing for a billion dollars worth of refunds, but you don't have the people paying in a billion dollars worth of remits, uh, that makes it pretty challenging, right, from a cash flow perspective. Uh, and so, you know, kind of the initial reaction when we did that was the people, the some of the bureaucrats were saying we need to just stop paying refunds and i was like yeah it's probably not good. we probably shouldn't do that we probably need to figure out uh, a way to continue to pay a refund number one because people needed the money and, you know, i mean there were a lot of people who had been laid off they needed their refund uh, when they filed for it you know and, and number two um the state has to pay nine percent interest after 45 days on those refunds if we haven't paid them and so to me, I was like, let's come up with a plan. So we got together. I went to the legislature and worked out a plan to use a different fund in the treasury to, to provide a cash flow loan to the general revenue fund so that we could continue to pay out those refunds. And we're, because of that, you know, we worked with the governor's office on it. We had to work with the Department of Revenue and Office of Administration. And because we were able to do that, we were able to continue to pay. We paid out hundreds of millions of dollars in refunds uh, in April and May that if we hadn't done that, would have had to have waited for three months to be paid out and would have cost the state millions of dollars in interest. And so, uh, so those are the kind of things that we can, you know, if we kind of work together cross departmentally, we can do. So my focus now is, um, you know, I, I will tell one story about unplanned property and then I'll wrap up here. The, you know, we get safe deposit boxes turned into us as well. And so each year we get about a thousand safe deposit boxes from our friends at the banks in the state that if they've got somebody that has a safe deposit box and hadn't paid rent on it in five years, they send it to us. So we get, like I said, a thousand of those a year. And so we have to open them all up and inventory the contents of that and store those for a period of time, hoping to find the owner. And so you find all kinds of cool things. Like I returned when I was in St. Louis a couple weeks ago, I gave a guy his baseball card collection back that he had forgotten about after 20 years. And it was probably a $50,000 baseball card collection. I had all kinds of stuff. I met with him in St. Louis and gave it back to him. We did a little press story. Uh, you also find, uh, you just find a lot of interesting things in state deposit boxes. I'm sure that some of the banks have seen, seen some of that. You find cool things like, you know, signed letters from presidents or uh, you find, we get military medals all the time. You get jewelry and you get, you see family pictures. And you also get some weirder things like uh, we had one that we opened up last year that just had a clown suit in it. And just like that was it, just a clown suit and a safe deposit box. And we they opened one up before I was treasurer. They opened one up that had a uh, change of clothes, a ski mask, and a handgun. And I'm not sure what the plan was there, but clearly it didn't get executed. Um, it, you just there's you never know what you're gonna find. And then I'll, you know my I guess my one piece of advice to you is don't put photographs that you don't want anybody else to see in a safe box. <laughs> that would be, and especially if you're going to forget to pay rent, uh, do not put those in a safe deposit box. Uh, I'll just leave it at that <laughs> on, on that front. So uh, besides that, I'm on a bunch of boards and commissions. I'm on the pension plan board, which I really enjoy. I'm, I'm kind of a nerd that way. I like pension policy. We've done a lot to try to improve our pension status. I mean, pensions is, is going to be a huge financial crisis for state and local governments in coming years. In the state of Missouri, we've done a lot to, to kind of preempt that and, and get, get ourselves on the right track. So uh, I think we're, in, we're moving in the right direction on pensions. I'm on uh, the 
the Missouri Housing Development Commission, which oversees state low income housing tax credit program, which is a very political mess sometimes, but uh, that's an, also an area of policy that I uh, spent a lot of time in. So the bottom line is, um, you know, how I ended up here was not like what I planned. Uh, it just happened for, for the most part through working hard and focusing on, on, on things. I still own the business down in Shell Mob. Um, I, I, you know, I still really like private sector stuff. I have no idea, you know, what I'll be doing. Uh, and, well, assuming I win the election and I serve four more years, I can serve one more term as treasurer after that. Um, the way I look at things is, you know, I just kind of believe that God's going to put me wherever he wants me and I'll go there, you know, and uh, if, if, if that means I do something else in politics after this, then that's what it means. If it means I go back and uh, run, run my business or run a different business or whatever that is, uh, that, then that is what it is. Uh, but I, I guess the takeaway I would give you is that, you know, just work hard. Uh, don't be afraid to take chances. Uh, Cause you know, I mean, frankly, that's kind of all I've done in my life is take chances. Sometimes it's going to work out. Uh, sometimes it's not, but you just got to kind of keep going. And, uh, and that's kind of, I guess the advice I would have to you in terms of, I guess that's kind of what you're looking for. Uh, but, uh, Anyway, so with that, I will answer your pre-written questions. <laughs> <laughs> From Jeff an hour before. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just do a couple quick highlight questions, and then if you've got time, I'd like to hear some of your, with the election coming up, your stance yeah. on what you can and what you would encourage people yeah. and how they vote. So you're obviously a very, very busy guy. Uh -huh. So um, I a compliment to you is when you first got elected office, he was everywhere. I don't know if you guys got is usually at most things, ribbon cuttings, things like that, golden age games for nursing homes pre-COVID and all that. You're always there. So how do you manage your time and prioritize, especially now your real estate treasurer? So it's gotten more difficult since the transition over to statewide office because you know the treasurer's office is a full-time function. We have about 50 employees, and so it is a thing you have to manage it. And uh, you know, I would say, you know, I also didn't have a family when I got elected the first time and now I have a wife and two kids. Uh, so it has gotten more challenging. Um, I would just say that uh, good people is what makes it possible uh, in terms of both at, you know, at the treasurer's office, at the business, um, obviously a, a very supportive wife you know, and family. And so I'd say between that and I also, uh, I decided after my kids were born, I decided to get my pilot's license because I wanted to be able to, you know, get home. If I was in Jeff City, I wanted to be able to get home if I needed to. They had uh, health problems. Uh, they have developmental challenges as well. And so I just decided I wanted to be able to uh, go where I needed to go when I needed to go there. So I got my pilot's license and got into buying airplanes. And and so now, like, I, when I go to Jeff City, uh, when the legislature's not in session, most of the time when I go to Jeff City, I'm fly, I'll fly up in the morning and fly back in the evening and I can make that trip and it's about 40 minutes in the air and uh, you know it, with ground time it makes it about an hour trip from door to door and so uh, that makes it somewhat more manageable you know uh, and then I just kind of like you know last night I was up till 12 30 working you know after everybody went to bed I just stayed up and and kind of caught up on some things and so sometimes it's it's difficult sometimes it's easier and uh, you just kind of gotta, you know, prioritize and manage it, I guess. So, as a leader and being a treasurer, what kind of culture do you try to create in your office? Well, I think you always, you know, as a leader of any organization, I think you always have to create an environment where people are not afraid to uh, make their opinion known uh, in terms of related to the, you know, the operation. When I first took office as treasurer, one of the things that linked the deposit program I talked about, uh, one of the things that we had to do is we had to change a lot of the rules because it was really growing. This is back before interest rates were almost negative, but uh, it's obviously, it's a more attractive program, both for the banks and for the borrowers where interest rates are higher because banks will get the cost of the funds that, you know, it'll be cheaper cost of funds. Well, right now the bank can go get, you know, pretty much unlimited deposits at 10 basis points probably. So it's a, uh, you know, a little bit different now, but we had to put some limits on it. And so we were trying to kind of game plan how we would change this, change the program. And one of the guys that works every day on that program was like, well, you know, my opinion doesn't mean anything, but, you know, if, you know, if 
he did. I don't remember what his suggestion was at the time. I think we ended up doing what he suggested. But the takeaway was he he had the kind of preconceived notion that his opinion really didn't, didn't matter. And to me, that was like a, a sign of, you know, things needed to probably change. People needed to understand that, like, if you're in here working on this every single day, your opinion matters a lot to me. You know what I mean? What, what you uh, think about this is important because, you know, frankly, I've been here for one week and uh, I know nothing about what you do every day yet. And so I'm, I'm still trying to learn that. And so I think trying to make sure that people feel comfortable uh, telling you things is important as a leader. And, and then trying to, uh, you know, empower people to make changes. You know, I think, uh, I think that's, that's kind of the name of the game for most success, successful organizations. I think my, you know, micromanaging is not good. I think you have to get people in roles that you trust uh, to make decisions and uh, stay on top of things, obviously, but that, that would be kind of the, my, my, my view of uh, how you lead. Uh, last question, but I'm going to lead into that is how do you deal with difficult people in your role? Uh, well, I think always, both when I was in the legislature and, and, and as the treasurer, a lot of people don't like, you know, telling people no. Um, so you get, whether, you know, whether it be a legislator or a lobbyist, most times it's a lobbyist who, you know, would be well-connected, would come in and demand something or, you know, need something in the budget or need something. And, you know, like, kind of to me, one of my favorite things is telling people no. So it actually, you know, because when you do that, your yes means more. And so that to me was, I, I, I've always found that being honest with people, uh, whether that's uh, a vendor in your business, if you're having cash flow problems, talk to your vendors about it. Uh, if you are in the legislature and people are trying to count votes, you know, and they ask you where you stand on it, don't tell them one thing and do another. Um, I, you know, I just think always letting people know where you stand uh, and if they're a difficult person, you know, sometimes you're going to end up butting heads with them. I've had, I, this is an interesting question because I think to a lot of people, I am a difficult person. <laughs> So, so it's like, how do people deal with me? I guess is really the answer to the question, or the, the question you're asking. But that that's just how I would say: is just to be upfront with people, be honest with them, stand your ground uh, when you know when you need to, and you know don't get pushed around. And then last question, and then you'll have about ten minutes to kind of talk about ballot issues. Um, how do you stay motivated and avoid burnout being as busy as you are? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess for me, like. My motivation is uh, my family, and um, you know I, I want to. Number one, I want to provide for my. I just like all of us do. You know, you want to provide for your family. You want to provide them as good a life as you can. My motivation on the state side, you know, on the political side, is probably more than like, you know. I, I believe some things very strongly, and there are some other people who believe the exact opposite very strongly. And I feel like, just in the experiences that I've had, I've I'm like willing to work hard to defend those things and to go to the mat, on, you know, uh, on issues that. And, and some of these things are totally out of the. This is not like necessarily partisan stuff. Like to me, like transparency in government is a big deal. You know, the people getting, being able to have access to information in government, being able to get answers about things, making sure like this low income housing tax credit, credit program, I would say none of you know what that is or what it does. Maybe one or two of you do. Uh, but to me, the way it was being run was totally wrong. And it was costing taxpayers a ton of money and it was making certain individuals really wealthy, uh, and, you know, at the expense of every other taxpayer. And so, you know, I worked very hard against a lot of very powerful people to try to change it, the way it worked, change the, uh, you know, the, the rules that were favoring one group of people. Uh, and I have had, I think, what, at least modest success uh, at, at doing that. Um, and frankly, if I hadn't, like, the political risks and the you know, in terms of like the, the pressure that I was getting, you know, 
making it more difficult to fundraise for, you know, running for you know, office. It, those were all like consequences of that, uh, but I just didn't really care, you know? And, and, and so I get, and I don't think that's a super common attribute, frankly. And so that's why I've kind of done the things that I've done. And that's why I've, I'm continuing to do those things because I just get motivated by trying to see that the right thing gets done. Does that answer your question? So I think regardless of your political affiliation, I think we can all agree Scott is a great representation of Southwest Missouri. So I respect your opinion on ballot issues and I think you look to do the right thing regardless. So in the last you know, five, 10 minutes we have, what are some thoughts that you'd like to express on yeah, things so we need to know? I don't know about your local issues if there's anything on the ballot. So I'm just gonna talk, there's two constitutional amendments. One uh, is term limits for statewide office holders that don't, are not currently term limited. So in Missouri, the House and the Senate are both limited to eight years uh, term limits. And I, and I support that. I, mean, I, I think, frankly, if that didn't exist, I probably would never have ended up in office. I think there's a lot of good, I think it's a double-edged sword. You have people that end up leaving that, have, that would be, you, you, that are doing a good job, that are forced out. Uh, but you, I think it also provides opportunity for new people, new perspectives. And so I think, you know, Net, net, I think it's a good thing. Um, the governor is limited to two terms in the state of Missouri. Treasurer's office is limited, limited to two terms in the state of Missouri. So I'll be able to, because I served less than two, less than two years of the term that I'm currently serving. This one doesn't count for me, but I'll be limited to this upcoming term if I win and one more. The governor will be limited because he served about two and a half years. He'll be limited to one more term. So this would be the only one he could run for. But the lieutenant governor, the secretary of state, the auditor, and the attorney general's office are, are not term limited currently. And so, like Governor Nixon, before he was the governor, he was the attorney general for 16 years. Um, you've got uh, other, I mean, people in both parties have spent a long time in some of these offices. And so, this would, Amendment 1 would enact those term limits on all those statewide offices. So, the ones that are not currently term limited would become term limited starting after the election. Uh, so, I, you guys do what you want on that. I'm, I generally support term limits. Uh, and I, I mean, that's coming from somebody who is going to get kicked out of the House of Representatives because of term limits. So I, I support I support term limits. Um, the other is Amendment Three, and so the big this is the the one that's pretty complicated because in 2018 there's a group that created they called themselves Clean Missouri, which is a pretty good you know name to pick I guess, and they raised millions of dollars to get a ballot an initiative put on the ballot. There's two ways that you can put something on the ballot in Missouri. One is the legislature can pass a resolution to put something on the ballot to amend the constitution, or it can be a statutory referendum, or you can do what's called a citizen's initiative. And a citizen's initiative, because it's so cost prohibitive, I mean, it costs, if you don't have a million dollars, you're not going to get it on the ballot because you have to collect signatures and you have to get, I can't remember how many signatures and it's got to be in six of the eight congressional districts. It's like hundreds of thousands of signatures. They get some you know, people to go out there and collect these signatures. Uh, and then you actually have to have somebody write the language that you want to put in the constitution. And so we, you know, it's happened from time to time, but in 2018 Clean Missouri was formed and they wrote this ballot initiative that did a few things. Number one, it limited gifts from lobbyists to legislators to $5. Which, when I was in the House, we had we had a bill to completely eliminate lobbyist, lobbyist gifts that I voted for multiple times, and it kept dying in the Senate, which was frustrating. So it ended up on this proposal, which is, generally speaking, good policy and something that most people would support. Right? And then we also, in 2016, we had an amendment, constitutional amendment, that put campaign contribution limits in the Constitution. And so before that, we were in a situation where anybody could give unlimited amounts of money to any candidate uh, for running for office. So we'd get, you know, million dollar checks from, from people in your candidate committee. Um, I think that, that, that there's a lot of issues with, because now you have PACs that are independent, independent third parties that can still accept unlimited amounts of money. And so you've got uh, people who, uh, you know, who can self fund a race that can put unlimited amounts of money into their own race. Um, so it's just it, there, now it's a lot more complicated. There's still probably the same amount of money in politics. It's just the candidate committees 
the committees that the candidates themselves control are limited to only being able to accept, you know, 2,500 bucks for a Senate candidate or something like that. I think it was 2,600. And what they did was they lowered it from like 2,600 to 2,500. And then they wrote the ballot language. Should we reduce the campaign limits to state Senate candidates? Uh, should we, you know, and I think it took the House candidates from 2,500 to 2,000 or something. Should we, so it was like, should we eliminate lobby or limit lobbyist gifts to $5? Should we lower campaign contribution limits? And should we ha have a nonpartisan demographer draw state legislative district, state legislative maps? Well, the last part was what they really wanted to get done. The first two things were basically ballot candy to get people to vote for the whole package. But the third thing was what it was all about. And that was how we redistrict our state legislative districts in the state. So we have congressional redistricting, which is actually done by the legislature. That's in the Constitution. So when we redraw our congressional districts each year, or not each year, after each census, every 10 years, the legislature is responsible for, the state legislature is responsible for passing that map. The state legislative districts, though, so the state house and senate maps have, have been drawn by a bipartisan commission on redistricting. And it's made up of five Republicans and five Democrats. Those people, I believe, they're, they're appointed by the governor, right, uh, is the way that it is right now. Uh, and so you're picking five Republicans, five Democrats, and they're responsible for drawing the state House and state Senate maps. And if you just Google and look at what our current House and Senate maps look like, the goal is to make them compact and contiguous districts, right? So that, you know, when I was in the House, I represented all of Berry County. And because Berry County wasn't quite enough people to equal what you have to have to make a full House district, they gave me a little piece of Pierce City and a little piece of rural Stone County over south of or north of like around Crane. And so when you look at the maps, it looks like a pretty reasonable, you know, way to draw the maps, right? And the Senate districts, they tried as much as possible to make those districts out of whole counties. So there was some rounding, right, to get them pretty close. But for the most part, like our state Senate district here is McDonald, Barry, Lawrence, uh, Stone, and Payne. It's just those five counties. And that is it. And then you, so, and it's the same way all of the state. Well, the clean Missouri people don't like that because uh, we have super majority Republican legislators, legislatures, both in the House and the Senate. And so the goal of clean Missouri was to make the legislature have more, essentially more Democrats, because we do have more Democrats than, than the representative number of state House and Senate people, folks. And the reason is because a lot of the people who vote Democrats for Democrats live in Kansas City and in St. Louis. I mean, if you look at the map, so all of the state Senate Democrats are either in St. Louis City and County or Kansas City. That is it. Those that's the only place there's any because outstate Missouri is by and large dominated by I mean, most of the people are Republicans. And the interesting thing is, though, the concentration of Democrats in some of these districts in, in the city, there may be some districts that would, if there was a Republican running, would, that Republican might get 10% of the vote. I mean, some of these districts are literally 90% Democrat. When you come out to, you know, in Berry County, it's probably 75% Republican. And so what ends up happening is you may have 40% of the state that would vote Democrat, and they only have maybe... 30% of the legislators, 25 to 30% of the legislators. Well, that's because of where, where, they, where the Democrats live in the state, right? And so the goal of Clean Missouri was to, to draw the districts, make the number one priority of the districts be partisan fairness. And they define partisan fairness as drawing the districts to include as close to as possible, essentially equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans in each of the districts. Well, Obviously, I, you know, you're, we're in Barry County, and there are probably 20 to 25 percent of the voters here are Democrats. But in order to make this district 50-50, where do you go? I mean, you can't really go anywhere except for Kansas City. I mean, there's not, a, there's only one Democrat-represented House district in Springfield. And if you took, you know, really very many of those away, then that wouldn't even be a Democrat district. So the only place you can go, frankly, is like Kansas City or St. Louis. Uh, maybe a little bit in Columbia to get those Democrat voters and disperse them into these outer, these outstate districts, right? And so then your options in terms of drawing the district, 
are that you either have to draw a non-contiguous district, meaning you draw a district that would, instead of being all of Barry County, it'd be maybe like half of Barry County, and then like another place somewhere in Kansas City, and put those two pieces together and call it a district. And then you've got people in Kansas City running against somebody in Cassville or Monette or whatever, or you'd have to draw these districts that are like very like, well, I mean, they call, they say what we're doing now is gerrymandering. And the real the reality of the situation is what they're wanting to do is gerrymandering. They're trying to manipulate the map drawing process so as to advantage one political party that's currently not uh, not doing as well in, 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 these, in these legislative races. And so the option is you draw non-contiguous districts or you draw uh, at the very least non-compact districts, meaning you draw a district that has a little bit of population in Kansas City, and then it kind of winds its way through the state down to the corner of Missouri, right? And then you've got, you've still got the same problem. You've still got somebody in Nevada could be representing Cassville and part of Kansas. I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of crazy. So the ballot proposal amendment three, you know, frankly, the legislature took a page out of Clean Missouri's book and they put some ballot candy with it. They eliminated, they, so they went ahead and finished the job and got rid of all obvious gifts. So they got rid of the $5 gifts and they took the state Senate contributions down another hundred bucks. And I understand why they did that. It's to make the thing look more attractive because frankly, Clean Missouri has raised millions of dollars. Almost, I think almost all of it has come from out of, outside the state. Um, you know, we got, they got a half million bucks from the NEA last week. They've gotten all these random like most of it's dark money meaning nobody has any idea where it's coming from uh it's coming from like these nonprofits c4s in washington dc that don't have to disclose who their donors are so they're getting money from very wealthy people who are funding these efforts to change state legislatures and they're bringing it into the state and they're buying tv ads and you know trying to convince you to vote no on this and so to me, like, I understand the gripe that some, that they have, like, they want more Democrats in the legislature. The, the way to deal with that, if you're the Democrat, if you're a Democrat or if you're the Democrat party, is to do a better job of appealing to out state voters. It's not to try to draw the legislative districts in a way that could have somebody from Kansas City representing Cassville or somebody from Cassville representing Kansas City. The other thing it's going to do, frankly, is most of these city districts, not most of them, a lot of these city districts are represented by black people. I mean, they're, they're black, that, that is, you know, there's probably, I would say 25 or 30 black members of the legislature. And that number is going to probably go down. So I think by virtue of if you, if it stays the way that it was, so in 2018, that initiative passed. So if it stays that way, I think number one, you're going to end up with legislative districts that just look ridiculous. You're probably going to end up with a less diverse legislature, frankly, because you're going to draw these inner, these like center city districts out into the suburbs and into rural Missouri. And so you're going to have, you know, at least some of those races where the, the suburban or, or, or rural representative or Senate candidate is going to win and displace somebody who's uh, you know, a black member of the legislature. And so it's, it's got all kinds of problems. So what, what Amendment 3 would do is it would the, the main component of it would be to reorder the priority to make compact and contiguous districts, again, the top priority of redistricting so that we don't end up with these geographically spread out districts. We have districts that still look like kind of what they look like right now, where you have all of a county and a house district so that, you know, the member, that member of the legislature, you know, Amanda said I was at everything, you know, because I could get from my house in Cassville, I could get to anywhere in my district in 40 minutes at the most, you know what I mean? If you, you know, how, if under this next, I mean, if it doesn't, if Amendment 3 doesn't pass, like I'm just gonna, going to be very entertained watching how this thing goes down in terms of how the legislative districts get drawn. Because I think if it doesn't pass and we get redistricted under the way that the ballot initiative or the constitution is currently written, that people are going to freak out. I really think they will, because they're going to be like, what do you mean my state rep looks four hours from here? You know what I mean? It's so, uh, so anyway, that's, that's Amendment 3. So I know it's confusing. You're going to see a lot of ads that bash Amendment 3. I'm voting yes. And, you know, I mean, I think, so my request would be that you consider voting yes. And it's very complicated, obviously. 
to the extent that you are able to explain explain it, uh, please do because you know the ballot language has been rewritten twice now. The legislature wrote it once, then this judge uh, rewrote it, and then another judge rewrote it. So it's now been rewritten like three times. And it, you know, so I have no idea how it's going to turn out. Uh, it's going to be challenging because, like I said, those out-of-state folks are spending millions of dollars to beat it. Um, but that's that's my two cents on the ballot initiatives.